I want to welcome you all to the museum this evening. I, uh, I know that there are many, many polls on all of our time, and I think that tonight is going to be a really engaging evening. My name is Amy Gilman, and I am the Associate Director here at the museum and the Curator of Contemporary Art. And I'm going to be introducing our wonderful speaker tonight. But before I do, I do want to mention a few bits of business before we go on to the evening. The first is that I hope that all of you are aware of the workshop that uh, the museum is holding in partnership with the Arts Commission of Greater Toledo here at the museum tomorrow about applying for artist residencies. Uh, Caitlin this evening is gonna talk a lot about how you know the different kinds of residencies there are introducing to a lot of different things and that will be a much more practical, how do you actually do this sort of thing it is free, but you should, you do need to sign up for it. If you have not signed up for it already and you decide in the course of tonight that you would like to be here tomorrow, we still have some spaces available and there will be a clipboard at the exit here and if you would like to sign up for it, you can do it tonight. On the table outside. On the table outside. Uh, also, on October 13th, I hope you will all join us. That is a Thursday evening. October 13th, we will have a master series event in the Paris style where we will have uh, an unveiling of an incredible acquisition for the museum that I cannot tell you what it is yet. Aww. So you will find out about that shortly and I will just dangle it in front of you to say that it is a, a masterful acquisition and a really incredible addition to the museum's collection and the the, really one of the foremost scholars in the field is going to be coming to speak about it uh, on October 13th. So I hope that you will join us then. <laughs> I can't tell you who the speaker is or that might let you know what the actual object is. <laughs> but tonight it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker. Caitlin uh, Strokash is the executive director of the Alliance of Artist Communities. The organization is an association of artist communities and residencies, uh, both national and international, supporting artists in any discipline uh, in developing their own creative work. Their mission, and if you allow me to read this, is that believing that the cultivation of new art and ideas is essential to human progress, the Alliance's mission is to advocate for and support artist communities to advance the endeavors of artists. I think something that links very beautifully with our own mission here at the museum. Caitlin herself began at the Alliance in 2002 before becoming the executive director in 2008. Uh, since she's been there, she has, become, she has begun a number of significant initiatives, including the Emerging Programs Institute, which is actually where I first met Caitlin earlier this year, which is a kind of boot camp for people who are either looking at beginning an artist residency or examining one that has currently been in existence for a bit and trying to find some additional models, some good peer relationships, etc. And both Jeff Mack, who's the manager of the Glass Studio here, and I attended it in Kansas City earlier this year, and I can say it was a marvelous, marvelous experience. She also began the Leadership Institute uh, for the Alliance, where really it really helps train leaders uh, in the arts and uh, for artist residencies. Um, during her tenure as leader, as the executive director, the membership has grown over 40%, the conference attendance has doubled, and the organization has granted over a million dollars in funds to artists and to residency programs. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin Strokash. Thanks, Amy, and thank you all for being here, especially on a Friday evening. Um, I'm going to just talk really um, kind of broadly about what the field of artist residencies looks like. I'm not going to talk about too many specific residency programs, but just kind of give you a sense of what the field is like. Um, what the experience of being an artist in residence might be like, and then I'm going to leave plenty of time for us to just have a conversation and answer any questions that you might have afterwards. Sorry, can we start this? Uh, 
Um, I think Amy already defined this field really well, but um, what I think is important to focus on is this common purpose that artist residencies, artist colonies, artist communities, whatever you call them, this common purpose that they share, which is to provide artists with the time and space for the creation of new work. And it is this focus on creation and on the creative process that I think is um, particularly uh, interesting and compelling about residency programs. They are not about production. Um, they're not about dictating the outcome of what you do. They're really a special, unique place for artists to be able to explore and experiment and take risks without anybody dictating what's going to come out of that. And I think that's a, a pretty spectacular thing to have in the world. Um, this is a great sign that I love. This is at the Atlantic Center for the Arts <laughs> in New Smyrna Beach. At the other end of the walkway, they have a sign uh, to the public which says, notice artists at work. Um, please do not go beyond this point. So at the other end, it's, it's really an invitation to artists to expand their thinking, to really use this opportunity as a way to, um, to develop their work, to take risks, and again, to, um, to just go beyond what they think they might do without anybody looking over their shoulder and, and uh, judging that. We talk about artist residency programs a lot as research and development labs for the arts, and I think that kind of gets at the core of what happens there. Um, and sometimes research and development does involve production. It involves stuff like this that looks a lot like work. Um, but the other side of research and development is that sometimes it looks like this. And residency programs really understand the relationship between um, production and reflection and, and the role that both of those things play in advancing an artist's work. And I think um, it's really pretty special to have a field full of organizations and people who understand that this is also what artists need. This um, lack of expectation is something that I think throws a lot of artists off and, and that they find really uh, transformative. Um, if there are opportunities to show your work in progress and work that's happening at a residency, artists often find that incredibly liberating, that there isn't this expectation that something is already being uh, polished and that it's already perfect. And I think this is just a great quote from a choreographer um, who did a residency recently. The, uh, the, the intention of residency programs is obviously to provide a kind of environment where artists can get a lot of work done, but it's also to provide a kind of support and nurturing that leads to a really profound transformation. And I think a lot of artists find that when they do a residency. And I'll, I'll shut up for just a second so you can read this. This is from an artist who is in her early 60s, who did her first residency a couple of years ago at the Jurassic program um, outside of San Francisco. And she had applied for a grant that we have for emerging visual artists in California. And in her early 60s, she was still very much emerging in terms of her career. And her work has been absolutely transformed from the experience, I think, as you can probably tell by her words here. There are um, about 500 residency programs in the United States, and there are over a thousand worldwide. We're not exactly sure how many. They keep popping up all over the place. Um, we know of residencies in at least 42 countries um, and all over the United States. This is just kind of an example of some of the places around the world. Uh, the top left is in Iceland, uh, the top right is in Xi'an, China, the bottom left is in um, Perugia, Italy, and the bottom right is um, off the coast of Brazil. So just a little, little sampling there. They all look pretty nice to me. <laughs> Residency programs bring together one or two artists at a time. They can bring together up to 65 artists at a time. Um, Skowhegan, I think, is probably the biggest group at a time. The picture on the far right is at Skowhegan. 
Um, you know, the average is maybe 10 or 12 for some places, but there's a real range and it offers you a lot of variety in terms of the kind of community, uh, the internal community that you have access to during a residency. And um, residencies are typically thought of as residential, as a place that you go away to and that you live in, but there are also lots of residency programs, like the one here at the museum, um, where it's a studio residency. And um, there are lots, particularly in urban areas, lots of these kinds of residencies that are not, um, maybe don't offer housing, but offer a similar kind of community of other artists and a support network for you in residence. Residencies are not just for established artists. They're not just for emerging artists. Um, they're not just for artists graduating from the top MFA programs. They're really for all kinds of folks from different backgrounds, um, from different countries, from uh, different um, career stages. And I think that kind of mix that you often find at residencies is also uh, something that's very exciting and can be very inspirational as an artist in residence. Residencies also support artists in every art form. Um, the majority of residency programs are multidisciplinary, so visual artists and writers and other folks are all in residence together. Um, this is just some great examples of some of the visual art stuff that's happening at residencies. Um, Performance-based artists, we actually just completed a big research project on support for dance at residency programs. Um, lots of writers, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, screenwriters, playwrights, journalists, um, artists working in film and digital media, installation artists, and then there's also a growing number of residency programs that are supporting scholars, scientists, ecologists, and other folks who are uh, collaborating with artists or who are in some way exchanging ideas with other uh, folks in creative fields. This internal community of residencies, um, the internal community of other residents is, um, is something that, again, is, I think, surprising for a lot of artists, the impact that that has on their experience. And there are um, other artists and residents that will inform your experience either as collaborators, as peers, as mentors, um, as, as people to bounce ideas off of. And sometimes those things end up in kind of formal collaborations. Um, sometimes they're, they just happen organically. Often they happen even after the residency is over, that you find that you uh, connected with somebody that you want to work with in the future. So there are some residencies that specifically are designed to encourage this kind of collaboration and exchange, whether it's with the other artists and residents or whether it's with the local community. And then there are also lots of places that are really about retreat and giving you an opportunity to just close the door, to step away from the public, to step out of the marketplace, and to, um, to really have some respite. <coughs> there are um, more residency programs that are looking at ways that they can also support artists with opportunities to show their work. Um, so beyond just having a studio and having a place to live, also looking at how artists can, um, can, can develop their careers during residency, whether it's through kind of traditional gallery exhibition opportunities or um, open studios or festivals or more uh, informal sorts of things, um, performances that just kind of happen ad hoc. I have to say there's a lot of really nice looking residency programs out there, right? <laughs> Um, most people, I think, think of residencies as being rural, and um, certainly that's the history of the field. It kind of started as these rural retreats, um, and that's true still for about 60% that are in rural areas or in small towns. This is something we've seen change a lot in recent years. So there are many more residency programs now that are located in urban centers, and obviously this gives you a, a range of, of kinds of communities to interact with while you're in residence. There's also a, a long history of environmental stewardship and ecology at residency programs. Uh, lots of residency programs that have a dual mission, both to support artists with time and space, but also to protect the land, to protect the property that they're on. Um, some of those kinds of programs 
work hand in hand with the residency where they are interested in artists who are addressing environmental issues in their work. And sometimes those things just kind of run on parallel tracks so you may not even be aware that that's something that's important to the program. But for artists who um, are making work that addresses the environment, there are lots of residency programs that are very, very interested in that and very interested in having artists come in and engage their communities in that way. There are lots of residency programs like the one here at the museum that are embedded within other cultural institutions. Um, so, uh, you know, as opposed to the kind of standalone artist colony in the woods model, lots of places like um, the Exploratorium, like Pilchuck, um, where there are residency programs that are within other kinds of <coughs> institutions, museums, universities, cultural centers, and things like that. And obviously this offers you a very different kind of experience, um, different access to the public, opportunities to participate in workshops, um, to be in a place where there's a different kind of activity and a different kind of energy that's happening. These are not the kinds of places where you're going to walk into a studio and close the door for three months and not in interact with anybody. One of the things that I love when I'm doing site visits is to see these amazing buildings that have been rehabbed into residency programs. Um, and the, the, uh, the bones of those buildings really um, speak to artists while they're in residence and can often inspire them to create work that's based on the space or to see, the, say, see through those spaces in different ways. These are just a couple of great examples. Um, the top left is the Bema Center in Omaha. The church is the McCall Center for Visual Art in Charlotte. Um, the Steel Yard is in Providence, which is an old uh, working steel company. And the bottom right is a mining facility in Utah called Spiro Arts. So just a, a really interesting sampling of what some of those kinds of rehab spaces are like. And then there are lots of other residency programs that were built for the purpose of being a residency program to begin with. And they have wonderful facilities that were um, specially designed for the purpose of serving artists and their creative work. These just couple of examples on the left is Atlantic Center for the Arts and on the right is um, Montalvo, which is outside of San Jose. These are two very different examples. Um, that I think speak um, well to some of the range within residency programs. Um, there are a lot of really very rustic kinds of, of retreats. Uh, the space on the left is Art Farm, which is in Marquette, Nebraska. And uh, the director of Art Farm likes to say that Art Farm is 19th century living and 21st century art making. Um, and I've been there, and I have to say 19th century living sometimes is a little bit of a stretch. Um, they have um, interns there every summer. Their residency program just happens in the, in the dead of the summer in the middle of Nebraska. And uh, when they are orienting their uh, interns to come out to Art Farm, they say, you have your choice. You can have a roof or you can have a floor. You can't have both. <laughs> Um, and the artists are asked to contribute something back to Art Farm while they're there to do a certain number of hours a week to uh, contribute to the place. So um, we gave a grant to a, a young woman artist a few years ago who did a residency at Art Farm. And it was the director of Art Farm's dream because not only was she an installation artist who wanted to work in their giant barn, but she was also a licensed electrician. <laughs> it's kind of the perfect combination. Um, and I, I, I mentioned Art Farm specifically because, um, because of two things, really. One is that the artists there who are there together develop, a, uh, develop as a cohort and develop a real fellowship among each other in a way that you might not find if you were in a place where everything was taken care of for you. Um, the artists that are there, because they've been rolling up their sleeves and really digging in and really working to, to build and create Art Farm as this sort of living organism, have an immense loyalty to that experience and to that place and to the, the other artists that are there. And the other reason why I'd like to mention Art Farm is because artists often hear from their friends, from their peers, from students, from faculty members about what's the best residency program. 
um, that McDowell is the best, or Vermont Studio Center is the best, or you have to go here, you have to go there, because it's the best one. And Art Farm is kind of my litmus test, because when I talk about Art Farm, usually half of the folks think, that sounds really cool, and the other half of the folks think, that sounds really awful. <laughs> I want a roof and a floor. <laughs> So I think it's just a good thing to keep in mind that there's no one best place, there's no one perfect match for everybody, that everyone is gonna find a different place that's gonna feel um, perfect to them or as close to perfect as anything does. Um, so if you're hearing other people talk to you about what's the, the best residency, the greatest residency, you know, the, the best thing that ever happened to the world of residencies, um, just remember Art Farm and, um, and that there's a different kind of place for everybody. And then the one on the right I just want to mention a little bit, which is the uh, John Michael Kohler Art Center residency, which actually is embedded within the factory uh, where, where people are making toilets and sinks and faucets and things like that. And um, it's an interesting program because the artists have access to a level of technical expertise and facilities um, that they would never otherwise have, and an ability to work in scale and multiples that you will probably never have again. And there's a growing number of residency programs that are embedded within commercial businesses or industrial sites um, where artists are, are able to access this level of expertise and facilities and equipment that they might not otherwise have. So Kohler is a great example of that, probably the longest standing one. There are a few others, and um, and it's an interesting, if you're really interested in that kind of work, it's an interesting part of the field that's really expanding right now. So you really, I think, get the sense of the range of these places. And again, that there's really a different style of place for every person. Um, for some artists, they're gonna thrive in a very Spartan kind of environment. The picture on the left actually is one of the dune shacks, which is on Cape Cod that's right on the, on the edge of the national seashore. Um, they, there's no electricity. They're heated with a wood burning stove and you're really just there in bleak isolation by yourself for, um, for about a month. And that's pretty much what the whole space looks like. You have to bring your own sneakers, I think. Um, and then the other is this uh, wonderful example of these very elegant, very well-appointed um, kind of residency programs. This one happens to be the Ligurian Study Center, which is just outside of Genoa, Italy. Um, so really a very broad range. And I think what's important is to think about, if you're thinking about doing residencies um, as an artist, to think about what kind of environment is going to <coughs> inspire you, is going to push you forward in your work, um, is going to uh, give you the kind of fuel that you need. It may be uh, that you need to be nurtured and taken care of. It may, need, may be that you need to really be challenged and sort of roughing it for a while. Um, there are lots of different approaches to thinking about a residency, but most of them have more to do with you than they do with, with anything else. Um, there are residencies that are uh, really research or production based and then uh, lots of residencies that are um, also really just about retreat and that quiet time. And artists find their own home away from home at lots of different places. One of the things that I think is really um, interesting as I go around and visit a lot of residency programs is that every place is really trying to find this right balance for their program between solitude and community. And again, at the heart of all of this is this, this incredible trust in artists, that they can be trusted with this time, trusted with this space to pursue their own creative practice in whatever way they need to to advance their work. And again, whether it looks like um, those folks that were doing really production-based work or whether it was the folks who were taking the nap in the sunshine in the meadow, that incredible trust that every place is, is striving to, to give you and to create an environment that will foster that. So that's kind of my 
crash course in artist residencies. Oh, sorry, I have one more slide. There you go. <laughs> Every time I ask for images from folks, I'm always knocked out. It's always great to share these. Um, so I'm gonna end this part with just one more quote that you can read from an artist here. And that's at um, U-Cross in Wyoming. So I would love to hear from um, you all about what some of your ideas are about residencies. I'm not exactly sure who all is in the room, so maybe just to get a sense how many artists are here. Most of you? Oh, excellent. Um, any artists that have done residencies? Yes, Mary, you count. <laughs> um, any artists who've done residencies already? Great. Where have you been? Jurassic and Provincetown. Oh, wonderful. And uh, Atlantic Center for the Arts. Great, good. So you guys recognize some of the pictures up here. Terrific. How many of you are um, thinking about residencies and thought maybe you might like to do one? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think you had a question. Yeah, I hate to be like starting artists in the group, but like how do you finance like the residencies? Like I I had seen a couple flyers for like I think it was Spokane or something like that, and it cost like five thousand dollars. Like it was like college tuition just to go there for like a couple months. And I mean, I don't have the money to pay for that. So how would I go about getting grants or like other ones that pay you to go to them? Like like how are the different finances for residents? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I know that the workshop tomorrow is going to get a little bit more into nuts and bolts stuff too, but I'm but I'm happy to answer that. Um, the majority of residency programs are either free or have a stipend. So there are um, maybe a quarter to a third that have a fee that they charge, but a lot of those also offer scholarships and subsidies and things like that. So there's really just a handful that charge a fee that that's, it kind of is what it is. Um, and those places that do, places like Skowhegan, places like Vermont Studio Center, um, in some ways are very much an extension of school. There are a lot of visiting artists that they're paying to bring in in some ways. I think particularly Skowhegan um, for emerging artists to have uh, access to a lot of visiting scholars and visiting artists and other folks like that. But there are lots and lots of residency programs where there are no fees at all. Um, going to a residency is still gonna cost you something. Um, in terms of uh, travel, um, shipping materials, um, you know, whether or not they provide meals, if you need to, you know, it's all that kind of stuff. If you're going to, um, you know, sublet your apartment while you're gone or if you have to pay bills while you're gone, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of sort of nuanced stuff that goes into figuring out what the actual cost to you is, is going to be. Um, and if you're uh, an alumni of a school or if you're a student at a school, the career services centers at, at schools um, are, are often really good sources for helping you sort of figure that out, figuring out what kind of grants there might be available for professional development and things like that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Can you talk a little bit about your experience of other um, artists and residence programs um, in museums? Sure, yeah. Um, the Exploratorium is one that I'm, I'm really familiar with, which is the um, Science Museum in San Francisco. Um, they have uh, local artists, but they also have visiting artists that they house in hotels and things like that. So a lot of those kinds of residency programs that don't have their own dedicated housing are still able to support artists from outside the community through other you know, partnerships with hotels or supplying apartments or whatever. Um, at a place like Exploratorium, there's, I think one of the challenges um, is how much public access to the artist is there and how much um, kind of private, self-directed time do the artists get. And I think for any of the programs that are embedded within other cultural institutions, um, that sort of push and pull of the public and the private is is something that they grapple with. Um, 
uh, for the Exploratorium and for a lot of the other museum-based programs. I think finding the right kinds of artists who, um, who are seeking out that kind of engagement with the public and who want to talk about their process to the public, who want to make that process accessible is a really important part of, of that matchmaking between the artist and the program. Um, I don't know of any museum-based programs that don't expect the artist to engage with the public in some way. And there are lots of artists who want to. Um, a lot of the artists who go to museum-based programs um, are also really looking for access to equipment or access to a collection, um, some of the other resources that the museum already has built into it. So um, finding you know, that right kind of match with people is important. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston is kind of a really quirky example of a place that has a residency program. And there it's not in any way equipment based and the collection is exactly what the collection has always been and it doesn't ever move and it doesn't ever change. And for them, their artists and residence is a way to illuminate the collection in different ways and to bring something new and different and changing into a museum that by design is not going to change. Um, so I don't know if that gives you a little sense of what some of the options are, but I think the real, the real, um, the real trick with the museum-based programs is to find artists who really want what the museum has to offer. Um, so it's not going to be the McDowell Colony kind of experience, and there are plenty of artists who are looking for something else. How does your role differ from applying directly to the Venus? This for, for, for a residency or any other residency directly. Uh, are you a clearinghouse for residencies, or how does how do, how do we're you work? we're not we're uh, we're a service organization to the residency program. So most of the work that we do is working with the programs themselves to develop their programs, best practices, research, that sort of thing. We run a couple of smaller grant programs where artists apply directly to us, but those are really very specific in terms of um, geography or a particular population of artists or um, you know things like that. But we don't, we don't otherwise make any sort of calls about who gets selected for residencies. It's more to help build the organizations themselves. Um, I just want to say I was um, on the board very happily for a number of years, and my first uh, visit at a board meeting was at the Anderson Ranch out in Snowman, and it was a really exciting time because I could not believe what was happening. For instance, Eric Fischel came at that point, and everybody thought, oh, how wonderful, and everything, but he was absolutely shocked and shifted all of his interests and started studying photography. <laughs> and so it to me, not only do you know you don't know what you're getting into, even if you're an experienced <coughs> artist, wonderful things happen that surprise you and, and surprise everybody around you. Yeah, I think that's that's the the um, the effect of that kind of trust that you have and with people not not dictating what you're gonna come out of it with. Um, that people end up doing completely different things. And I hear from artists all the time who say, um, I was gonna do this and I ended up doing that in a totally different way. Um, Audrey Niffenegger, who wrote The Time Traveler's Wife, which was on the New York Times bestseller list a couple of years ago, is uh, primarily a visual artist based in Chicago. She founded the Center for Book and Paper Arts and she does um, these really wonderful um, picture books. Uh, she was in residence at Ragdale, and, uh, which is just outside Chicago. And she was there as a visual artist, and she was really stuck in what she was working on while she was there. And she said to the director, I know I'm here as a visual artist. I know you try to balance the number of visual artists to writers, to composers, whatever. But um, I just kind of want to write. I don't know. I just thought it'd be nice to have a chance to write. Well. I kind of gave it away at the beginning, but she wrote The Time Traveler's Wife, um, which you know obviously has transformed her her career, um, having this you know best-selling book. And the response that she got, of course, from Susan, the director, was, "Do whatever you want. It's fine. We, we don't care if you applied as a visual artist. We don't care if you 
sent us these images and said you were going to work on this other project. It's fine. We trust you. We chose you. Not just based on what work you were going to do here, but based on who you are as an individual and the strength of your creative voice. And do whatever you need to do with that. Um, so I think a lot of artists find that that is an opportunity to move in a different direction, uh, even if that direction is not successful. It may be a success because you need to get that out of your system and then go on to something else. Um, I think you know the, the point that Mary brought up as well is that uh, whether you are an emerging artist or a mid-career artist or an established artist, if you are a household name artist, there is still a place for you at a residency program where you are just like everybody else and struggling just like everybody else and getting stuck and trying new things and sometimes failing and sometimes failing spectacularly and sometimes succeeding spectacularly at whatever level you're at. Um, I'm from the Midwest, so um, I think I get a little bit of that Midwestern um, crisis of confidence um, that maybe we're not quite good enough for some of these well-known places, that they're all going to be filled with people who are more accomplished than we are. I see a couple of heads nodding. Um, I know I'm not totally crazy. Um, and I think, you know, one, it's good to remember that even at a place like McDowell or a place like Yaddo, where they have this incredible who's who list of people who have been there, a lot of those folks weren't famous when they went there. Um, Truman Capote was not famous when he first went to Yaddo. Uh, Leonard Bernstein was not famous when he first went to McDowell Colony. They were not household names. Um, so you may be the next household name, and you don't know it yet. <laughs> um, and it's also really not about that. And there are lots and lots and lots of places that are interested in nurturing new voices, um, people who are trying new and different and interesting things, regardless of what their resume looks like, regardless of what their ex exhibition history looks like. It's really about you and the strength of your creative voice. Um, and not about the other kinds of marketplace validators that you otherwise have to live with all the time. Not cutting Are there any university-based residencies? You know, it just struck me, we send faculty away on sabbaticals and they go everywhere and do wonderful things. Mm -hmm. but are there university or you know, large art school programs? There are. There are lots of university-based residency oh. programs. Um, some are universities who happen to have a separate facility. Um, uh, John Hopkins has a uh, Evergreen House, which is a separate building that they have access to. Um, Maine College of Art is just starting up a residency program. They have a smaller property that's in Stony Brook, Maine. Um, the uh, Maryland Institute College of Art actually has a residency program in France um, where alumni uh, can apply, but other artists can apply as well. Um, there are a lot in the performing arts, um, particularly in dance, because there's access to facilities and production capabilities and things like that that you really are hard pressed to find in other places. So yeah, lots of university place ones. They tend to be a little harder to find. They're a little harder to identify. Sometimes they just kind of operate under the radar. Um, they're often curated by uh, the presenting groups within the universities. So they're a little trickier to find. But we have a number of those listed uh, in our database. Hey, could you talk a little bit about some of the different ways in which um, the artist residencies determine what, what artists become? One of the interesting things about the uh, conference we were at was that there are a lot of models for how do you choose which artists come to you, mm -hmm. and there's a there's a lot of different things, and I hadn't even realized what the range was. Yep. Yeah. Um, you mean how like the selection process yeah. itself? How does that work? Yeah. Um, this is something that's shifted a lot in recent years. I think it's actually pretty exciting. Um, it used to be that the gold standard was this sort of blind process where people would apply and only your work would be looked at. And there would be a, 
very esteemed jury that would look at the work and they would make selections. They wouldn't know your name or your age or, or anything like that. And they also wouldn't be looking at any other kinds of artist statements or anything of that sort. And there's something really sort of beautifully democratic about that. Um, but there are a lot of residency programs are also wanting to make sure that it's a good fit, um, that you have a good experience, not just that you have great work, but that you're also going to have a good experience there, that, that the values kind of match. Um, especially, you know, you think of a place like Art Farm. I mean, it would be silly for them to just be choosing people based on their work. They want to know, I mean, yeah. they. I say they, it's one guy. It's Ed. It's Ed the farmer at Art Farm. <laughs> Um, you know, Ed wants to make sure that you want to be an art farm, that you kind of know what you're getting into. So it would be silly for him just to look at your work and not, you know, not look at anything else. So there's been a real shift in the field where um, you're often asked for um, a statement of, of intent. What, what do you think you might do while you're there? And again, understanding that it's going to change. Whatever you say you're going to do, it's going to change. Um, so it's not about kind of pinning you down to something, but it's just about getting a sense of who you are, and what direction you're going in, what you're thinking about, um, to make sure that it's a good match. Um, or asking you just, you know, why do you want to do this residency? To talk about whether it's a, a connection to that particular community, um, or you really want to research that particular uh, area of the country. Um, or you really want access to those kinds of resources or facilities or something that that place has. So there, there has been a shift that way in um, being a little bit more nuanced. And then sometimes it's also about the group. It's about curating a mix of people together. So a lot of times the stuff that will come up at the sort of end of the selection process after things have been narrowed down and narrowed down, then sometimes it's like, well, we can't have nine women and one other. so you know we have to sort of mix it up or we can't have everybody from California um, and only one person from the Midwest or something like that so sometimes it comes down to those sorts of things um, but those are the, the very late decisions the um, the earliest decisions and the most important decisions are made based on the work itself and the strength of the work um, so really that other stuff comes later but, um, but there is, I think, a much stronger sense in some of the things I was saying to Brian about museum residencies, that you make sure it's gonna be a good match. Um, you know, residency programs want the artists to have a great experience. So it's good for everybody that way. I saw a couple of other hands pop up earlier. Yes? Is, is the Alliance of Arts Communities involved with permanent communities of residents? I mean, permanent communities where artists live. Um, not so much. We uh, there are some that are kind of hybrid programs, like the Torpedo Factory in Virginia, which has um, kind of three-year-long residencies, which tend to end up being more kind of permanent live workspace. Um, there are a couple of other umbrella organizations around the country that specifically consult with those folks, so we tend not to do that too much. But um, art space which does all the art space projects all around the country. They're kind of a developer and consultant for that work. Um, they're probably the best source for more of those permanent kinds of places. With the advent of new technologies, are there places that are particularly geared towards artists working in digital and multimedia arts? Yes, yes, there are actually a number of those. Um, Harvest work is one that's really well known. Um, lots of other places that are <coughs> converting um, some of their previous um, low-tech kinds of resources into higher-tech resources. There's a big shift in that happening right now. Anderson Ranch is one place that's really, um, really invested in their digital media lab. Um, places like Sundance, obviously, that, that work a lot with film and, and some new media that way. Um, you know, every place is looking at how to keep up their facilities and to be able to support more artists that are working in digital media. Um, the McCall Center in Charlotte has great digital media facilities. Um, there are a handful that specially, you know, that really specialize on that, like iBeam in New York, um, as well as Harvest Works and a couple of others. Um, there's a place called 103.9 Wave Farm. <laughs> 
which is the radio frequency that they uh, broadcast through. That's that's um, that's they call it transmission arts, but they're sort of this kooky um, media radio. It's this sort of weird high tech, low tech hybrid thing that happens there. Um, so yeah, lots of places that are um, that are looking to support more artists in that way, and then a handful that specifically focus on that. Um, I think one of the great developments with digital media is that it allows residency programs to support artists that they previously had to have a lot of facilities for. So like photographers, it used to be, you know, you could only do a residency if they had a dark room. Nowadays, it really hardly matters at all. Um, filmmakers, um, people working in animation and other kind of digital video, you know, a lot of artists are completely self-sufficient on their own laptops at this point which means that they can take advantage of residency opportunities that they might not have been able to do before if there weren't you know, film editing equipment and all that kind of stuff. Composers too, I mean it's interesting how much easier it is now to support a composer if you've got a great electronic keyboard. Whereas before you had to have, not only did you have to have a grand piano, but you had to have a studio that was off somewhere away from everybody else so you could play the piano and not you know, disturb the other residents. So that the facility stuff is actually getting a lot easier. Yeah. Can your database be um, accessed on the web? Yes, it can, and it's free. It's right there. <laughs> um, we um, we're launching a new website in a couple of months, but the one that's up there now, um, you can search by. Um, Location, you can search by length of residency, uh, you can search by what season you want to go and only show you ones where the deadline hasn't passed already for that. Um, specific equipment, so if you need to have access to uh, you know, printmaking facilities or glass facilities or a recording studio or a dance floor or whatever, um, you can search by all those kinds of things as well. You can search by where you can bring your kids or your spouse or your pet. Um, a lot of people looking for those. <laughs> there aren't too many, I'll just forewarn you. Um, but you can search by it if it's a deal breaker. Um, yeah, so there's about a hundred or so different criteria on that search template that you can, you can uh, look for things that way. And then there's also a link to our international partners. We have about 40 or so international programs in our database right now, and we're building that up. But there's also a link to a couple other sites that do more international programs. So some of you that are thinking about residencies, anybody want to say what, what they're thinking about, where they might want to go? Has your wish list changed maybe in the last half hour? No one wants to say. Our maybe farm. That's a our farm, right? <laughs> How many people think our farm sounds great? Me. How many think our farm sounds like a nightmare? <laughs> exactly. They have, they have, I think they still have it right on the homepage of their website, a picture of a tornado touching <laughs> at our far <laughs> So you know, that's actually the far right picture there is our farm. Um, Do you actually make art there? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's like farm. Yeah. It's not making art. There's it's another, uh, let me see if I find, there's another picture of here of our farm as well. I want to see a picture of a tornado with somebody who just has the roof. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's easier. It's better, you have, it's better if you have the roof. It's uh, it's you don't need the you don't need a floor so much if there's a tornado coming, but you, you, you probably want a roof. I don't know where there was another art farm picture in here. Anyway, um, oh, there we go. On the left, the dancer there. Well, and then again, it's an interesting sight because. Um, to have a, a contemporary choreographer there and, and to be working with other dancers, there is no dance studio at Art Farm. I mean, there's barns and um, they have actually 17 buildings that they've moved from other farms around the, the area. Um, there's an old one-room schoolhouse. I was talking to some students about this yesterday. It's on a, a, basically a lazy Susan, so you can rotate in. It's maybe like 10 feet by 10 feet. It may have blown down by now, so don't put me on this. I was there maybe six years ago. Um, but you can rotate it. So as Ed described to me, 
if you don't like the light over there, you just rotate it. <laughs> Which I have to say, I thought was pretty awesome. Um, but I think, you know, it's, a, it's not what you would think if you're a choreographer, that you're going to go out to a farm in the middle of Nebraska that doesn't have a dance studio. There's no sprungwood floor. There's no theater. There's no, you know, lighting boards and all these kinds of things that you think that you need. And I think a lot of artists are really inspired by some of the limitations that they find at residency programs, and then it pushes them forward in, in some really interesting new ways. So now everybody wants to go to <laughs> Maybe still just half. <laughs> Um, we have a few more minutes if there's one or two more questions. Oh, Sarah Jane is waving a brochure in the back. Um, Sarah Jane wants me to let you all know that we have a conference coming up next month in Chicago. Um, and there's some brochures at the back for those of you who um, might be interested in starting residency programs, in meeting lots of residency directors and lots of other really amazing people. Um, as Amy was saying, we do these kinds of gatherings um, every year to bring together people who are really exploring ways that artists can be supported in the creation of new work. And I have to say that the folks that run these kinds of places are a really special breed of individuals for people who <coughs> decide that they're going to get up every day to help artists be more amazing. Um, it's not a, uh, it's not the kind of profession that is easy to sell, easy to fundraise for. Um, it's so intangible. And for people to decide that that's what they're going to do, and they're going to deal with all the messy stuff of, you know, providing meals and making sure that bedrooms are ready and, you know, all the kind of messy hospitality stuff that comes along with a lot of this work. <coughs> Um, the folks who run these places are just really, truly incredible, special people. And for those of you artists who are thinking about doing residencies, you should know that this is a field of folks who are devoted to helping you develop as artists. And they want to hear from you. They want to know what you're thinking. They, um, they're incredibly accessible and personable and approachable folks. Um, it's why I get up and do my job every day, because I get to work with all these people around the country who are supporting people like you. So if you're thinking about doing residencies, if you're feeling a little nervous or timid about it, reach out to these folks. If you have questions, just send them an email, or pick up the phone. Don't do it the day before the deadline. Um, <laughs> everybody's cranky the day before the deadline. Um, but really, you know, don't sell yourself short. And don't think, I'll never get in. I'll never be able to do it. Um, I'm not like those other people. There are hundreds and hundreds of places out there that want to support you. And I really encourage you to um, do some research, find some places that seem like a good fit for you, and then put yourself out there. And you may not get into every place. You may not get in the first time. But there are people who are looking at your work. Um, it's a great. It's a great experience even just to put together an application, to put together your images or a portfolio, and to start thinking about how you're presenting yourself, thinking about what you might do at that time. And there are lots and lots of places out there that would be really happy to have you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you.